Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Before we start with our practice questions for the day, we have an announcement. Baiju's exam prep IAS, as part of its PTS 2023, would be conducting the second free mock test on 13th of November at 9.30 a.m. and the subject would be polity. So what is that you have to do? Follow the link given in the description box, give the necessary information and you would be able to take up this free second mock test conducted by the Baiju's exam prep IAS. Let's get started and look into the first question. Consider the following statements. Justice Sikri was the first lawyer to be appointed directly to the Supreme Court bench. When it comes to appointing judges to the Supreme Court, the government can send recommendations of the Collegium back to them for reconsideration and if the Collegium reiterates those names, the government cannot object any further. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The answer to this is both. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express says, explain delay in appointment of judges, says the Supreme Court of India to government. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, it says, Justice Sikri was the first lawyer to be appointed directly to the Supreme Court bench. This happens to be the right statement. When it comes to the appointment of the Supreme Court judges, what is the eligibility criteria? He or she should be the citizen of India, has been for a at least five years a judge of a high court or of two or more such courts in succession or has been at least 10 years an advocate of a high court or two or more such courts in succession or in the opinion of president a distinguished jurist. This is the eligibility criteria. So if there is an advocate who has been practicing in the high court for about 10 years such a person can also be appointed as the judge of the Supreme Court. So the first advocate who was appointed as the judge of the Supreme Court happens to be Justice Sikri. So this statement is right. When you look into the second statement, when it comes to appointing judges to the Supreme Court, the government can send recommendations of the Collegium back to them for reconsideration. And if the Collegium so reiterates, the government cannot object any further. This statement is also right. What do we mean by it? We have the Collegium. The Collegium will recommend certain names from the High Court to be part of the Supreme Court judges. So in this particular backdrop, it recommends the names to the central government. So the central government will We'll look into it and if the central government feels that these people are not right to be the judges of the Supreme Court, it sends this list back to the Collegium and the Collegium will look into this particular list and if it so confirms once again, sends it back to the central government. In that case, the central government will have to appoint them. So first time, the Collegium will send the list to the central government. The central government will look into it and it may ask the Collegium to reconsider for the second time. After consideration, if it sends to the central government, the central government cannot object and will have to appoint such judges as the Supreme Court judges. So remember, this is what is followed in the memorandum. However, there is a small catch here. Whenever the Supreme Court gives this recommendation back to the central government, what is the time period before which they have to make an appointment is not mentioned in the memorandum and this is the grey area. And now we have the Supreme Court of India which has gone ahead and asked the government why are you not making the appointment, why are you delaying the process is what is this article all about. As part of the assignment, you have to put on the comment section who have been the advocates who are appointed as the judges of the Supreme Court. Please put it on the comment section. Has there been any jurist who has been appointed as the judge of the Supreme Court? If yes, please put it on the comment section. If no, please put it as no. Now let's look into the next practice question. With respect to Nada Prabhu Kempe Goda, which of the following statements is are correct? He was a chieftain under the Hoysala Empire. He is known as the founder of Bengaluru. After taking permission from the Emperor Tripakama, he built Bangalore Fort. He was multilingual and authored Kaviraja Marga, a Yakshagana play in Telugu. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is none because all the three statements that are given here are wrong. Why have we taken this practice question? 
because this article on the Indian Express makes a reference to Nada Prabhu Kempe Gowda. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, he was a chieftain under the Hoysala Empire. This statement is wrong. That is because it is not Hoysala Empire, but instead it is Vijaya Nagara Empire. So the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, yes, he is known as the founder of Bengaluru, but after taking permission, not from Emperor Nrupakama, as part of the assignment, put on the comment section, which dynasty did Nrupakama belong to? So Nada Prabhu Kempe Gowda took permission from the Vijayanagar Emperor, which happens to be Achyuta Raya. When we look into the third statement, he was multilingual and authored Kaviraja Marga. This is wrong. That is because he authored what is called as the Ganga Gauri Vilasa. Why are we discussing about this topic? That is because Prime Minister Narendra Modi unveiled a 108 foot statue of Nada Prabhu Kempe Gowda and also inaugurated Terminal 2 of Bengaluru Airport. The 16th century chieftain under the Vijayanagara Empire is widely acknowledged as the founder of Bengaluru. It is said that he conceived the idea of new city while hunting with his minister and later marked its territory by erecting towers in four corners of the city. He is also credited with having developed around 1000 lakes in the city to cater to its drinking and the agricultural needs. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following statements is our correct? Pratapgat Fort is a mountain fort located in Sangli district. It is the birthplace of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, the historic battle between Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj and Afzal Khan, the commander of Bijapur Sultanate took place at Pratapgarh. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is three only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express makes a reference to Afzal Khan as well as Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. Let us try and understand what are these options. When you look into the first option, the first option reads Pratapgarh Fort is a mountain fort located in Sangli district. This happens to be a wrong statement. Why? Because it is not Sangli district, but instead it happens to be Satara district. So the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, it is the birthplace of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj. This statement is once again wrong. It is not Pratapgarh Fort but instead it happens to be Shivneri Fort. This Shivneri Fort is in the Pune district in Maharashtra and it happens to be the birthplace of Shivaji Maharaj, the emperor and the founder of Maratha Empire. And the third statement is right. The historic battle between Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj and Afzal Khan, the commander of Bijapur Sultanate, took place at Pratapgarh. This happens to be the right statement. So the answer to this would be B. Now let's look at some of the key facts with respect to Shivaji Maharaj. Shivaji was given excellent training in military warfare and administration. He was married for the first time in 1640 to Sai Bai. Shivaji displayed his military zeal for the first time in 1648 when as a teenager he successfully got control of the Torna Fort which was under Bijapur. He also acquired Kundana Fort. Both these forts were under Adil Shah of Bijapur. He achieved great name after he defeated Afzal Khan, who happened to be a veteran general of Adil Shah. In the Battle of Pratapgarh in 1659, Shivaji's forces vanquished the Bijapur Sultanate's army. From this victory, he acquired a large number of weapons and horses, which greatly added to his growing Maratha army strength. In June 1665, the Treaty of Purandar was signed between Shivaji and Raja Jay Singh and Raja Jay Singh was representing Aurangzeb. Shivaji signed this agreement realizing that a war with Mughals would cost him men and money. As per this treaty, many forts were relinquished to the Mughals and it was agreed that Shivaji would meet Aurangzeb at Agra and Shivaji also agreed to send his son Sambaji as well. These are some of the important facts that you have to remember from the preliminary examination point of view. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statement. The IUCN status of Himalayan Great Langua happens to be critically endangered. Kalatap Kajur Sanctuary is an animal sanctuary in the Chamba district of Himachal Pradesh. Which of the statements given above is are incorrect? Since it is asking for the incorrect statement, the answer to this is one only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the Himalayan Great Langua. 
Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, the IUCN status of Himalayan Great Langur is critically endangered. This happens to be the wrong statement. Why? That is because the IUCN status happens to be endangered. So the first statement is wrong. When you look into the second statement, yes, Kalatop Kajiar Sanctuary happens to be a sanctuary in the Chamba district of Himachal Pradesh. So the second statement is right. Since the question is asking for the incorrect statement, the answer to this would be A only. When we speak about Himalayan Grey Langur, where are they? They are present in the Chamba district. They are present in the Himachal Pradesh. It is a colobine meaning leaf eating monkey. And of late, there has been a lot of threat to this particular species. What are the threats that are emanating with respect to this particular species? One is the human encroachment. As we all know, the population of the country is increasing. So we enter into the forest areas. We enter into those areas where these species are present. And ultimately, human encroachment, habitat loss, degradation, deforestation, increase in the human-related agriculture and industrial activities have become the main major threat to this particular species. Now that we have entered deep into their habitat, when they come to our habitat, what we will have is the animal-human conflict. We enter their areas, we take away their food and when they enter their original areas, what we will have which fight with these particular species. So basically, expansion of the human population and developmental work leads to the habitat loss. In order to overcome, an awareness has to be created. This particular species has to be recognized as the flagship species or the umbrella species so that we are able to protect these primates. And what is the significance of this particular species? They act as the seed dispenser, pollinator, seed predator, so on and so forth. And ultimately, it will increase the number of plant diversity in that area. Now, let's look into the next practice question. In India, which one of the following is responsible for maintaining price stability by controlling inflation? Department of Consumer Affairs, Expenditure Management Commission, Financial Stability and Developmental Council, Reserve Bank of India. The answer to this is Reserve Bank of India. This happens to be a straightforward question and this is from the year 2022. Now, let's look into the fact of the day. The fact of the day for today's discussion is currency monitoring list. What is the context? We have the United States of America's Department of Treasury, which has removed India along with Italy, Mexico, Thailand and Vietnam from its currency monitoring list of major trading partners that merit close attention to their currency practices and macroeconomic policy. What is the US currency monitoring list? The US Department of Treasury delivered its semi-annual report to Congress. So this is a report that is given to the Congress on macroeconomic and foreign exchange policies of major trading partners of the United States of America. The report reviews the policies of US trading partners during the last four quarters ending in June 2022. As of now, India is being removed from this particular list, but which are the countries which are still being monitored by United States of America? It includes China, Japan, Korea, Germany, Malaysia, Singapore and Taiwan. These are some of the regions and countries that have been still included under the currency monitoring list. What is this currency monitoring list all about? What is the criterion on the basis of this? Whether a country is part of this list or not? We have three important criterion that United States of America looks at. Under this legislation, the Treasury Department has to assess the macroeconomic and exchange rate policies of the US trading partners for three specific criteria. A significant bilateral trade surplus with the United States is a goods and service trade surplus that is at least 15 billion. A material current account surplus is one that is at least 3% of GDP or a surplus for which Treasury estimates there is material current account gap using Treasury's global exchange rate assessment framework. Persistent one-sided intervention occurs when net purchase of foreign currency are conducted repeatedly in at least 8 out of 12 months and these net purchases total at least 2% of an economy's GDP over a 12-month period. If there are countries which are meeting at least 
two out of this criterion that is when a country will be placed under the currency monitoring list so if a country is meeting two criteria or three then in that case that country will be held under the currency monitoring list but if it is meeting only one criteria in that case it will be removed from the currency monitoring list since india is meeting only one criteria it is removed from the currency monitoring list so remember putting a country under the currency monitoring list basically means that another country is manipulating its domestic currency so that it is hurting the currency of united states of america as well as its state let me give you an example we have china what does china do china manipulates its currencies so as it manipulates its currencies it also makes sure that its local currency is also depreciated as well why does it want its local currency to depreciate that is because it wants more exports from its country to another country we know for the fact that whenever there is currency depreciation this results in maximum exports from the home country to a foreign country so what china has been able to do is it constantly manipulates its country's currency so such countries will be constantly monitored by united states of america and if the trade sentiments of united states of america hurt such countries will be monitored this is on the basis of three criteria that has been drawn so if there are two to three criteria that have been met in that case a country will be put up on the monitoring list what does it mean for india it means that whenever a country is removed from the list it is not considered as a currency manipulator this means the reserve bank of india can now take many measures to manage the exchange rate effectively without being tagged as the currency manipulator by united states of america it is this that we have to understand with respect to this topic so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best